Do you like to work with metal, fire, electricity? Would you like to make money doing it? At Southwestern, we can help make your dream a reality. With our degree and certificate programs in welding, you'll be prepared for a career in the welding and fabrication industry in as little as a year. Check out our website and let Southwestern spark your career in welding today. This is Southwestern's Dental Assisting Program. In just one short year, you could be a dental assistant. Sign up now for your one-year dental assisting certification. Hi, my name is Ron Metzger and I've been teaching geology at Southwestern Oregon Community College for the last 20 years. It's an exciting time to be teaching in the health and science fields at SWAC as we work towards funding a new health and science facility at the college. Kalito Hall is the building I work in and it houses our science labs. It was constructed in 1965 and so the labs have undergone relatively little updating since that time. Over the years, we faculty have provided an exceptional foundation in the lab sciences. It's relatively easy to see how an investment in the health side of the facility will pay dividends in our local communities. The added lab and class space will allow additional cohorts in nursing students and new programs. This will allow our local residents to go through the programs and earn family wage jobs at Bay Area Hospital and all of our other local health care providers. As we look forward, it'll be interesting to see what we accomplish as a college and community with lab facilities and equipment equal to the task of teaching in the 21st century. I hope you will work with me as we move forward with this project. Most of you know I look forward to the day in the not too distant future that big me is not on that screen anymore. Uh, so if anybody has a few hundred thousand dollars just kicking around, uh, we'd be glad to have you sign a six-figure check and drop it off with the lease and the foundation. If you have five or ten dollars, we'd be glad to have that as well, because right now, one of the things that many of you have already heard about, we've got the Beetham family match, and so we've already made the state match for eight million dollars, which is, as you can imagine, a pretty fantastic endeavoring that took a, a village plus. And with the Beetham match on the table, we're closing in on that as well to get an additional $2 million towards this project, which I think is going to be crucial. Uh, I'm really intrigued also that until I saw it large on screen, I thought that Kara the Egyptian had put me on the poster for Dante's Peak. Apparently, it's some other guy. 
Oh, well. Anyway, uh, if you're bored during spring break, on Tuesday, March 27th, I've got the pleasure of doing an intro uh, about Cascade Volcanoes and volcanic activity uh, for something called Science on Screen, their National Science on Screen Night. And so there are a number of localities around the, uh, around the country that are going to be presenting science movies. Uh, now, nine out of ten geologists say that Dante's Peak is exceptionally better than San Andreas. If you know many geologists besides me, they don't exactly use those words, but I will use those words this evening. So if you're not doing anything, and also if you have a place to post these, I'd be glad to have you take them. And the little ones for your fridge. So there are also some posters for Dave Montgomery, who's making his third return back. Apparently I put one upside and one downside, not a good start. So Dave Montgomery has been here uh, when he first wrote the original Dirt, he came and talked about fish. Last time he talked about time and creation and geologist's view of Noah's Ark. This time he's actually coming back to talk about Dirt and growing a revolution should be another great night. Uh, it's right in tax season. so. Another, uh, another wonderful thing. Uh, if you haven't signed one of these handy-dandy little sheets, if you would do so on your way out, I would greatly appreciate it because it helps document where you're from, what your birthday is. If you want to put your anniversaries on, that's all good too. Uh, but it helps document this for uh, going after some of the Distinguished Lecture Series speakers. So this evening, how many of you have enjoyed the lovely weather, the snow, the sleet, and all of that? Just about, yeah, I'm glad you all are because I'm in trouble for it and I really don't like it anymore. I dealt with that earlier in my life. So I was very pleased that Dr. Nolan accepted responsibility for the snow because it's actually her name closer to snow on the, uh, on the poster. Yeah. My brain is frozen. That's where I'm going with this one. But her name is closer to snow than mine, but a lot of people have blamed me for the weather locally in the last two weeks, and I guess it's just a way of promotion is what I'm looking at. But I think right now with Dr. Nolan, she's currently at Oregon State, so there's a good local connection in the Pacific Northwest, and working with their hydroclimatology group. In just a few short months, she's going to go lead a hydro group down at University of Nevada, Reno. And so she's going to get closer to the mountains, closer to the snow, and basically her backyard as far as where her research is, uh, is associated with. So she's one of the world's leading authorities on snow interactions. And as we know right now, maybe not after the last few days, but we're at less than 50% of snowpack unless that's changed uh, in the last couple of days. And so the snow forest interaction and climate change, I think are some topics that are incredibly important to us locally, but certainly much broader than that as well. Without further ado, Dr. Ann Nolan. I'm so pleased to be here. Thanks, everyone, for coming out in this rainy evening. Um, I do love snow. When I had a chance to go on sabbatical a few years ago, I made it so it was an endless winter. We went and spent several months in the New Zealand winter, and then uh, in November, beginning in November, flew directly to Switzerland so we could have another winter, and it was great. So thanks to my family also for helping out with things like this. So I'm here to talk about the relationships between snow and forest and climate. And one of the reasons um, we care, well, several of the reasons we care about snow and forests and climate is that forests affect the way that snow accumulates because of canopy interception and because it changes the way it melts. And we also think of snow as, or I think of it as a moisture subsidy for forests, that it carries over from the wet season into the dry season after all of our precipitation has ended. And also, because we know that climate change is 
affecting and impacting both forests and snow at the same time. So I'm going to talk about several of these topics tonight and look forward to your questions at the end. So what do, what do we mean by a moisture subsidy? So the blue bars that are vertical represent or a cartoon, really, of monthly precipitation. And there's no y-axis on there, but a taller bar means a lot more precipitation. And, and this is what things look like in our region of the world, but also much of the American West. And so we have mostly most of our precipitation in the winter, and then summers are pretty dry. Um, and that's true all the way from, you know, California up to, um, you know, southern British Columbia and from the west coast all the way up to the 100th meridian. And the sort of uh, blob in the middle there represents the amount of water then that's contributed to the system by snow melt. So it's not all the snow that's accumulating, it's just the, the contribution from snow melt. And if you look at that, it's as the, as the precipitations ramping down, the snow melt is ramping up. And this is what I mean by a moisture subsidy. And so forests, really, all plants and all of our ecosystems in the West get to enjoy that moisture subsidy from that snow melt. It's an extra little bit of water that carries over from the wet season into the dry season. This is a map that I actually used for a proposal a number of years ago, but I like it because uh, my student made it. It shows uh, two different kinds of forests, the boreal forest in that light green, and that extends all the way from Alaska all the way across um, Fennoscandia uh, into uh, Siberia. It's the biggest ecosystem, a, a land-based uh, forest ecosystem in the world. It's huge. But we also have the temperate coniferous forest that you can see here in this area. And those are the areas that overlap with the snow. So let's ignore the forest that's down in Florida, but we can look at these two types of forests. And so the, the forest interactions with snow, that's, those are the types of forests that I'm really interested in. And mostly today I'm going to be talking about this temperate coniferous forest and how it interacts with snow. And the reason I'm picking that one is because even though the Arctic is changing really fast and those forests are um, being so impacted, um, I think that a lot of us can relate a little bit more to the kinds of forests that are close by. So this is some work that my group has been doing for a number of years. We've been looking at what's going on with snow in the dense forest and also in these forest clearings that we have for whatever reason, albeit um, clear cutting or some type of forest management, uh, maybe wildfire created this forest clearing, but we're really interested in, in how the, the structure of the forest and the age of the forest um, and the density of the forest, all these things, how they affect the way that uh, snow interacts with that forest. So we created this um, acronym after this network that we installed called the Forest Network, and that's the Forest Elevation Snow Transect, and that goes from uh, low elevation it's part of the snow zone to the high elevation. Here's just a little bit about that. These are our sites up here. This is in the Mackenzie River Basin. Do you guys know where that is? It's east of Eugene. So it's, yeah, so you can see down here on the locator map sort of where we are. It's part of the Columbia River Basin. And it's representative of a lot of West, West Cascades type areas and, and a lot of places like in the, high, in the highlands, in the uplands where we have um, forest and snow. Um, but the low elevation sites here are about around 1,100 meters, and then um, uh, the mid elevation maybe around 1,300, and the high elevation about um, close to 1,500. So 1,500 meters would be maybe around a little over between 4,000 and 5,000 feet. So the low elevation sites are where it transitions from rain to snow, but still mostly snow. The mid elevation sites, it's mostly snow, some rain, and the high elevation sites, it's almost always snow except in years like 2015. Um, so we get really deep snowpack. And I moved here from Colorado, and uh, where I lived for 10 years before this. And I worked at the National Snow and Ice Data Center. And we got outside, and we dug a lot of snow pits. And it was really fun, and um, got to look at really cold snowpacks with a lot of cool layers in them. And then I moved to Oregon, and the snowpacks here initially I thought were incredibly boring. It's like one big layer from top to bottom that's pretty warm. Like it's all like just below the melting point, like so close to melting. And it's like, oh, all the grain size is pretty much the same. It's really high density. It's like just heavy snow. But what I learned 
after thinking about it for a couple of years, is that it's so close to melting. Oh my God, that's what makes it so interesting. It could have been rain, but that day, that storm, instead it was snow. And so what happens then if you have more rain on snow events? Or what happens if that whole low elevation snow zone turns into more of a rain zone? So those are the kinds of questions I started asking and also really interested in what's happening with these forests that depend on snow for that moisture subsidy. So here's one of our sites, dense forests. We go through and we make snow surveys here in the students that are helping the undergrad interns are doing our snow surveys and they're tramping through here on snowshoes and it's, it's great, it's exciting. Um, it's also cold. Uh, here's one of the students going through one of the burned areas that we have up on the top of the Cascades. This is near the Pacific Crest Trail. But this is one of our open sites. And so here's our forested site at the, at the high site and this is um, nearby our low site here. I mean, our, sorry, our open site at the high elevation. So this is what they look like at the end of the snow season. The high open site, and this is an area that was burned back in 2003, that's why it's open. Um, all the snow's melted off, and, but, that, but the forest retains more snow. So this is pretty patchy in this case, but it, but it actually lasts like several weeks longer. You get just as much snow in both areas and sometimes even more in the forest because the winds are lower and you can accumulate more snow. You get a lot on the trees as I showed before, but the trees really reach their maximum amount of interception and then it all just falls on the, on the ground and you end up building up these huge deep snow packs. But the interesting thing about these forests is you can think of it as they're maintaining their own resource control. Think of it, if a forest were, was a person, you would, they would want to have that, they would want to keep that moisture subsidy for themselves. And so the open area, that snow melts off faster. It's open, it's open to the sun, it's open to the wind, and it, it just either evaporates or melts really quickly or it undergoes sublimation, which is just going from solid to vapor. But in the forest, that, that forest, that living forest, protects the snow itself, protects its own water resource, and makes it last longer into the dry season. That's what I mean by resource control. So of course it's not thinking about it, but it's interesting that that happens. And these forests have evolved that way, and so and depend on that moisture subsidy. And in fact, you can see that um, years when that snow melts off earlier, they undergo a lot of moisture stress. And moisture stress, stress can do bad things to trees. They can make them old faster and make them die faster. They can make them more susceptible to um, types of bark beetles. And they can also make them more susceptible to wildfire. But it's really interesting. It's different at the lower elevation sites. And I'll show you why in a second. At the lower elevation sites, like this mid site and the low site in our elevation transect network, and you see this all over the world, too. This isn't just Oregon. Anywhere there's warm trees, the snow lasts longer in the open than it does in the forest. Why is that? It's those warm trees and that warm atmosphere. Well, first of all, the trees are also, um, they're not intercepting as much snow because they never reach that maximum. So they're always kind of, there's a little bit less snow accumulating underneath. But the thing that really happens is those trees are warm and they're emitting long wave radiation, heat energy. And the snow around them absorbs that heat and it warms up and it melts earlier. So the trees themselves are melting the snow, which is kind of weird. They're not engaging in that resource control. In fact, the, the open areas have more water longer than the forest at the low elevation. So it's the opposite of what we often think. And I know this is a little bit of a complicated graph, but I want to show you this blue line is the, is the water equivalent depth of the snowpack. So if you took that snowpack and you melted it instantaneously, how much water would you have? That's the blue line. And so we're looking at from uh, the beginning of the snow season at our sites in, Jan in December, all the way through till um, the end of May when everything's melted off. And the height of the bars, of those colored bars, that represents, if it's above that horizontal line, it, re it represents positive energy into the snowpack. That's energy that's going to help melt the snowpack. If it's below the line, that's energy that's cooling off the snowpack. And there's different flavors of energy that go in and out of the snowpack. Sometimes it's heat energy from the, 
from the trees. Sometimes it's solar radiation energy. Sometimes it's um, latent heat energy, which is, involves the change of phase of water, things like that. But the yellow part of the bar is the long wave energy, and that's mainly the heat from the atmosphere, from clouds. You know how cloudy nights are not as cold as um, clear nights? That, plus the heat from the trees. And so those midwinter melt events that are indicated by the pink arrows there, those represent like a lot of this long wave energy. And so we can actually have melt in the middle of winter from long wave energy from the trees. So here's a picture of that. This is what it looks like. You've probably seen this a lot in these forests. You're walking along and you're, you know, you're on the snow, but there's a big open area right under the tree. And this is what I'm showing you. Canopy, canopy interception and long wave, that thermal energy from the trees melts the snow around it. So dense forests, dense warm forests are, are kind of um, melting off that snow pretty early. And here's just a, a few graphs to show some things. This, the blue line is the open. So here's our um, mid-elevation site that you get um, more snow in the open and it lasts a lot longer. So by the time you're here in May, here and here for the open and forest, you just have so much more snow left in the open area. And contrast that with the high site where you get just as much snow all through the winter, but at the end of the winter here, that the, the um, forest actually has more snow than the open. Well, what does that mean then? Why do we care? Let me go back here a sec. The reason is, is that as climate continues to change, and it gets warmer and warmer, and that snow line starts creeping up. You, what used to be mid-elevation trees that were cold, or the lower part of the higher elevation zone, are now going to start behaving more like warmer trees, right? And they won't be maintaining that snowpack. So the higher elevation forests, under continued warming, are going to have, won't be um, have that moisture subsidy that they have now. It's the open areas that are going to have more snow than the forests. And so that's a concern for healthy forests. We want our forests to have as much water as they can. The second part of this three-part talk is about fire and snow. And one of the things that we know, um, because of some work that a colleague of mine has published, oh gosh, 12 years ago now, is that when the snow melts off early, like over in this case, the frequency of fires is much higher than if the snow melts off late. You have a longer fire season, the fire intensity is greater, you have bigger fires, you have more fire complexes where fires merge and become really big, like the B&B &B fire a number of years ago in our neck of the woods. I guess you've had the biscuit fire down here. So um, in places where you have snow and forests, this is a big concern. And then the Columbia River Basin, that's a really big deal. Like Idaho, it's huge. The, the fire-snow nexus is really a big deal. So we know that a warming climate's increasing the number of wildfires and their frequency and their intensity and duration and all of that. And we know that a warming climate's going to decrease snow and there's actually a feedback from snow back to climate. I won't get in that today. But the question that we have is, what happens to the snow after a fire? And I know you're going to look at me and go, well, duh, it's melted. But <laughs> not during the fire, after the fire, like the years after the fire. So this, this is what it looks like after a fire. You've got standing charred tree trunks. You've lost the forest canopy. You've got charred woody debris falling on that snow, making it dirty, making it um, less reflecting, darker. Looks like this close up. A lot of variability, too. So after a fire, that charred woody debris sheds onto the snow. And it doesn't happen just the first year. It happens year after year. And so this is some work that I did with one of my PhD students. And this is showing the amount of charred woody debris is much greater um, in the burned area. You can see the black bars there are the, the amount of guck on the snow that's fallen off of the trees compared to a non-burned area. You know, forests are still going to have 
bark dust and little bits of branches and lichens and things falling on the snow. And that's what the green bars represent. But in the burned area, there's just a lot more stuff on the snow. It's also a lot darker. And that's what this shows, that in the, on the green lines here, this is the uh, unburned forest. And then the black lines are the burned forest. Um, the burned forest in the um, accumulation season is the dash line, and in the black line is the melt season. So what this shows is that, um, sorry, the x-axis is wavelength, and so this is the solar spectrum, and here's what we call the reflectivity or the albedo. And so here's the part of the, here's the part where we can see, the wavelengths the, where we can see this is what we call the visible. And what I want to show you is that unburned snow has a really high reflectivity. And, uh, sorry, unburned forest, snow in unburned forest has a high reflectivity. Snow in the burned forest is much lower. So this reflectivity up here is 0.6. That means it's reflecting 60% of the energy. So if it's reflecting 60% of the energy, how much is it absorbing? 40, yes. It's a, if it's reflecting 40% of the energy, it's absorbing 60% of the energy. So that's a really big difference between 40% and 60% absorption. So all of that solar energy is going into the snowpack. So not only have you removed the canopy and letting all that solar energy in, you've also preconditioned the snow to absorb all of that solar energy. So you end up melting that snowpack weeks early. And this isn't just something that happens one or two places. This is something that happens across the Western United States. And it's particularly potent in the Pacific Northwest, where we have a lot of forests coinciding with the seasonal snow zone. So here's a map that's showing um, the black blotches are forest fires in the snow zone. And so um, it's, I think, currently over 48,000 square kilometers. It's a big number. So the second question about fire is, after wildfire, does snow matter? Like, did the re does the regrowing vegetation care whether it's snow or rain that fell during the winter and melted off in the spring? Does it matter? Does snow matter? So here's uh, some work that I've been doing with one of my other grad students who's been looking at about 30 fires. I'm just going to show you one right now. This is the B&B &B fire from the um, Oregon Cascades, just near Sisters, Oregon, at the crest of the Cascades. In fact, that black dashed line represents the crest of the Cascades. So the left side of that um, colored map is the wet side, and the right side of that dashed line is the dry side. And you can see the different vegetation types there. So in asking this question, now we wanted to, to see if winter snow affected the following summer's vegetation. So we, the way to do this is to, we couldn't hire like 1,000 people to go out and measure all this stuff. But what we could do is use remote sensing satellite data of snow cover and of um, vegetation greenness. So we have fabulous free data from NASA. And we used uh, the winter snow cover and compared it with the maximum greenness for every single little half kilometer pixel um, in all of these fires. And we also used, looked at other variables, including burn severity, um, soil type, vegetation type, and so on. So here's before the fire. We wanted to know if there's any relationship before the fire. And what we found out is, at least in this area, as in most of the places we looked, there's like not really a significant relationship between snow, winter snow cover and the following summer greenness. And so this is just two years before the fire. You can see what these show. This is the snow cover on the x-axis. It's called the snow cover frequency, SCF. And this is the y-axis here is the enhanced vegetation index. Just think of that as greenness, this maximum summer greenness in every pixel. Each dot here on the plot represents a, a particular location where we looked at that relationship. And we looked, in this case, at a couple of different um, vegetation types. So we've got this Ponderosa Doug fir area that's kind of on this side, 
and we've got the western hemlock that's just up here in these two different burn severity regions. And just one year after the fire, we could see that that western hemlock regrowth, now it's not necessarily regrowing western hem hemlock, it's whatever is the understory right after the fire, um, really depended on snow. That, you could see a really strong relationship there. Whereas this Ponderosa, Doug Fir zone, it really didn't matter at all. It was just a scatter shot, basically. Three years after the fire, you could see a much weaker relationship up here with the western hemlock type up here, this area. But now, this is interesting, the Ponderosa Doug Fir started to develop this negative relationship, which was even much, much stronger five years after the fire. So it seems like there's a really complicated relationship going. Snow matters, but you have to know something about the vegetation regrowth patterns and the veg that's regrowing there. And probably the reseeding efforts and the soils and the burn severity and all about the topography. So it's not an easy thing. But what we're showing is that snow matters. And if you want to understand how the regrowth is happening, whether you're trying to reduce erosion after a fire or if you're just trying to track what's going on in the ecosystem um, as it's, as it's reestablishing itself after a fire, you need to understand the snow climate forest relationship. So I wanted to have enough time so that we can have some conversations. I'm also going to throw in here some things about climate change and snow. Um, this was just published, uh, came out yesterday in the journal Nature, and it was the first author is my uh, colleague Phil Mote at Oregon State University, and he's showing for the second time, the first article was published back in 2005, that we see a declining mountain snowpack. And so the original article showed that there were uh, significant declines in mountain snowpack um, starting in the 50s, but even looking way back into the 20s. And the biggest changes are in this pl these places where we have these maritime snowpacks, like what we have in, in Oregon and in the Washington Cascades in the Olympic Range and parts of California, um, that these areas being so close to the melting point are, are boring old snowpacks that are always like within a degree or two of that melting point are really susceptible to change. I call them at-risk snow because they're at risk of falling as rain instead of snow. And in this most recent paper, he's shown that indeed that we have seen a significant decline in mountain snowpacks across the West. It varies from place to place. So some places like in the high elevations, you don't really see significant differences, like in the high elevations of Colorado, for instance, parts of Montana. But you do see them definitely in the Pacific Northwest, and that's where they see the most significant effects. And that's where you would have expected to see that. In some other work by one of my former PhD students, we looked at um, the recent years of 2014 and 2015. You guys remember those snow years, right? Well, maybe you didn't because there wasn't much snow to remember, right? 2015, it was a historic low snowpack. And 2014 was really quite low as well, not quite as low as 2015. But what was really interesting about those two years is they, it turns out they serve as really good analogs for future climate. And so we were asking the question, future snow, and in this journal article, we answered it saying, yep, it is actually, from all metrics that we could use, it looks like future snow, at least for the Oregon Cascades where we were looking. And by future snow, I mean the way the, the um, climate models are in very good agreement about increasing temperature. They are very well aligned with past measurements during the historic period, and they all agree very strongly looking into the future, that temperature will increase by a certain amount, by certain times. But now, of course, we don't always know, like, at this year, it's going to be two degrees warmer, right? There's always sort of, in this period of time, we can say it's going to be two degrees or four degrees warmer. Well, what was interesting about, um, about 2014 and about 2015 is that 2014 looked like about a two degree temperature increase what we'd expect, and the precipitation wasn't that different from what we'd expect. 2015, the winter precip was about normal, but the temperature was almost 4 degrees Celsius. Multiply that by 1.8 for Fahrenheit, almost like 6 degrees something warmer than average. It was really warm. And so um, we got 
almost normal precip in December, January, and February, but it was so warm it just fell as rain. And so that's really what we saw. This is a picture of our high site at the crest of the Cascades, um, right by the Pacific Crest Trail in February. There's no snow. And it was really remarkable. And this was followed by the um, hottest, driest spring on record, too. And when I talk to the reservoir managers, they say, oh, you know, well, we're not actually that worried about the winter snow filling our reservoirs. It's more that the spring rains, we use the spring rains to fill the reservoirs because they're very worried about flood risk reduction. That's their main goal um, in, the, in my area. So they really um, had a, a problem. They didn't fill the reservoirs that year, and that was one of the years where they didn't meet the regulatory flow requirements for fish at Salem, for instance, on the Willamette River. They had irrigation shutoffs in the valley for the first time, and you know, people with junior water rights, it was really a hard, a hard time for them. And the, the uh, rivers were also significantly warmer, which is really tough on the fish. So there are all these kinds of effects that we're thinking about. We've seen these years as climate analogs. Um, we're trying to understand how they, how it all works. And so just to wrap up, and I'll entertain your questions after this, is um, we're still wondering, what does this mean for snow and for healthy forest? So far, we know that snow acts as a moisture subsidy in the transition from the wet season into the dry season. We also know that um, at the lower elevation part of the snow zone, that warm forests um, reduce snowpack and the total snowpack, but also reduce the retention of snow. But we know that the cold forests at the high elevations still are really great at helping retain snow, and that's important. So we can think about maybe we can manage our forests to perhaps reduce density, to encourage um, healthy forests and snowpack retention. We also know that after a fire, snow melts faster in these burned areas. The canopy's gone. The charred, woody debris on the snow makes it darker, and as, as I said before, it preconditions the snow to absorb that solar radiation. So that snow melts a lot faster. That is not snowpack retention. So the same thing that maybe helps with our snowpack moisture retention for healthy forests for snowpack retention probably also will help for reducing the incidence of severe fires, which is um, uh, wise forest management. So the other aspect of this is that after a fire, the regrowth seems to depend on snow. And what I didn't tell you is that most of the fires that we looked at, I would say about two-thirds of the 30 fires that we've looked at so far, they have a very positive relationship between greenness and snow. And that means that if you have a high snow year, you're going to have more vegetation growing that summer. If the following summer you have low snow, you're going to have less vegetation growth that following summer. So the snow and the vegetation track each other. That is, the vegetation actually tracks the snow. It lags the snowpack. So in a world where we have, I love saying that in front of a microphone, in a world where, in a, <laughs> in a world where we have a warming climate and declining snowpacks and increasing fires because of warming snowpacks, and warmer forests because of a warmer climate. What are the linkages and feedbacks that we are seeing and anticipate seeing into the future? How can we anticipate um, what should we be planting now and at what densities and how do we manage the forest now so that in 20 years or 40 years or 50 years when we want to have a healthy forest uh, and even longer, how do we think about that in in at the same time that this climate is changing. So it's what we call non-stationarity. So we, we're seeing non-stationarity in two ways, and I'll tell you what that means. If you have a non-stationary average, that means like for temperature, for instance, that means the temperature isn't, it's not varying around an, an average, it's that the average is changing too, right? So in this case, we've got increasing temperatures documented across the West and elsewhere in the world. So we have a non-stationary mean, that, and that means that what we did in the past under those average conditions might not work in the future. We also have non-stationarity of the variance, the variability around that mean. So what we see is an increase in the variability of temperature and precipitation, and year after year we're seeing global weirdness 
right? Maybe it's not right to call it global warming anymore. My colleague Catherine Hayhoe calls it global weirding. And she's a great uh, speaker if you ever have a chance to see her. She's terrific. So um, I'll just put that out there as a topic for consideration. And I do welcome your questions at this point. Thank you. So while we lead into questions, one thing that I neglected to mention before, you may have noticed a number of folks out at tables in the lobby. We've got representatives from the Coquel tribe, the Confederated tribes, South Slough, as well as Coos Watershed. So they'll be out there after the talk as well. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. I'll repeat the question so everyone can hear it too. So are the species of trees going to be changing with the warming? The question is, uh, are the species of trees going to be changing with the warming? And that's a great question. The answer is um, yes, in many cases, and we've already seen this. Um, what we found in a study that uh, of the in the Willamette River Basin from the crest of the coast range from the crest to the crest of the Cascades. Um, so this is a 30,000 square kilometer basin. What we found is that in the upland forests, our models show us that, these are dynamic vegetation models, our models show us that the Doug fir zone, this iconic Douglas fir zone that's on all of our license plates, is probably going to turn into more of a mixed forest if it were to be replaced naturally, if it weren't going to be replanted with Doug fir, right? So that means that the climate parameters would not be as friendly towards Doug fir, which is kind of amazing because Doug fir is so climatologically resilient. And that the upland, the higher elevation forest, the uh, the areas where you've got, you know, silver fir, noble fir, mountain hemlock, that you would start to see those species change as well and transition away. So we found that between now and uh, the end of this century, under moderate to slightly more aggressive climate change conditions, and we're on track for that right now, that we would see a 200 to 900% increase in the burned area in the western cascades on the wet side compared with historic periods. And so you have to think about not only is the transition of vegetation critical, but also the amount of timber that's available for harvest in the more aggressive climate scenario that was significantly reduced. So there was less wood uh, and the forest makeup was quite different in the future in this dynamic vegetation model. There's always already been quite a bit of documentation of shifts in the vegetation types in the California Sierra Nevada, where some of my colleagues like Jim Thorne have been looking at this. You can see that these species are kind of marching up the, up the range. A question here. Okay, after a forest fire and a burn, the, if you leave the debris, with the way I understand that, then as it falls down, it warms the snow up quicker, and the snow melts quicker, which decreases the vegetation for the coming year. Is that, am I hearing you correct? Or, uh, or, I don't or, know if I really tied those together, but so those are, we haven't made that full link yet. So the, the snow charred debris thing is that the snow melts a lot earlier. We're not quite sure what the hydrolic, what the water resources impacts are, what are the hydrologic impacts, but we know the snow melts a lot earlier. I don't know if how that affects stream flow or how it affects soil moisture. Um, we haven't done that study yet. What we really wanna do is follow the water, like figure out, okay, the snow's falling, here it is falling in a forest that burned. What happens to that snow? How does, you know, how does that then translate into soil moisture and then what do the plants do? That's a longer dry season for them. If, there's, if that snow melts earlier, that's a longer dry season for those plants. So I, I suspect that you know it's not going to necessarily burn again, but it might make them more moisture stressed, and it might make the plants that grow there, uh, you know, depending on this, the seeds that are available, 
might make it harder for them to um, regrow, to revegetate. So if, it might make a less friendly climate for the regrowing vegetation. Okay, if you clear that area after a burn, what effect does that have then? I don't know, we haven't looked at that. I know that's been a topic of contention for the um, area around the biscuit fire. I can speak to it from the simple angle only of uh, charred woody debris effects on snow. I, I'm not an ecosystem scientist, and it's a much, much bigger question than I'm able to answer right now. So. When you were talking about the snow difference between Colorado and Oregon, uh, it, do you think that's more of the effect of it's more the transition from rain to, to snow is very quick, whereas in Colorado, the coal mass is longer, and so you would expect that variation to occur. Yeah. Now you're talking about species and things like that changing. Is it possible that hardwoods would want to come in more at the lower level and then creep up? Yes, so I'll first talk about, I'll distinguish between maritime and continental snowpacks or snow climates. We're in a maritime climate. We're close to a large water body, the Pacific Ocean, and so it moderates our climate. We have um, winters that feel cold to us, but they're not that cold really. In Colorado, it's inland. They get those big cold air masses coming down from Canada, and yeah, it's a lot colder there. Um, so even in the even in the flat parts of Colorado, it's in the winter time, it's colder there. So that continental snowpack's colder. Um, it's not necessarily deeper, but it's definitely a lot colder. In Colorado, the snowpack does this thing, okay, air graph. Um, the snow increases over time and reaches a maximum, and then it melts. That's a continental snowpack. A maritime snowpack is, um, we get some snow in November and December, and then it melts. And then we get some more in January, and then it melts a little. And then February, and then it melts. And then we get a big spring snow, and then it melts. So we, in the maritime snowpack, you have a lot of these midwinter melt events, and you also have rain on snow. Colorado, we rarely, rarely have rain on snow events. So the structure of the snowpack is different, too. Um, your second part of your question was about um, mixed forests, these deciduous or hardwood types. Um, um, mixing in with the um, conifers, and absolutely, I think we're, we would see that. That's what our models show, is that um, when the climate is warming, when, these, when the conditions change, you, do, you would naturally get a mix. Now, it depends on what you would replant, but um, it, the natural environment, you would probably have more of a, a mix of lowland species um, mixed in with the conifers. So Doug fir wouldn't completely go away, no, but you would, you'd have more um, a mixed forest. Any additional questions? Actually, you just shouted to repeat it. Good, and I'll repeat it. I was just wondering if any of the effects of natural changes, such as Mount Minnetubo in 91, lasted two years without a summer here, out of striped green tomatoes. I wonder if there's been any studies correlating those periods of, you know, the greater. Yeah, um, those periodic and intermittent um, brief periods after a, a major volcanic event like Pinatubo um, that does cool globally, and it's really interesting. We saw those effects even in Greenland for a brief period of time for the year following Pinatubo. You could see in Pinatubo, for uh, those who probably don't remember necessarily, 1991, it was very explosive and put quite a bit of um, uh, aerosol particulates, ma mainly um, sulfuric particulates, up into the stratosphere. So atmospheric circulation took it all the way around at, from, you know, pole to pole and all the way around so that those particulates could, uh, were reflecting sunlight and cooled the planet for about a year. Uh, in 1992, they had one of the lowest melt seasons in Greenland. But those are very brief. And since then, we've seen years like 2012, where we had the entire surface of the Greenland ice sheet melting for the first time that we'd ever observed in the many decades of remote sensing data that we've had. So um, 
we do see these intermittent effects, but we, those are superimposed on this long wave trend of increasing carbon dioxide m mirrored by the um, attract aligned perfectly with the increase in temperature. So I appreciate all of you coming out tonight. I'd also like to thank the mill who is a last minute sponsor for this evening as well. And also hopefully we'll see you on some combination of March 27th, April 14th, as well as May 19th. I'd like to thank Anne for making time in her busy schedule to come down to the South Coast and speak tonight. And I know there were only about 12 different things going on around town, so thank you all for making time in your schedule to be here this evening as well. I know that Anne would be glad to answer additional questions, and why don't we have those questions take place out in the lobby, and those of you that are interested can check out and see what some of those groups have out there as well. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.